Good morning, everyone, and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, Northwest Liberal Democrats have enabled me to fulfil something on my bucket list. I am embarrassed to say I have never been to Lancaster before. <laughs> I found it last night a very lively city. Anyone who stayed here last night will be aware that we've coincided with live music weekend. <laughs> and I stayed in a pub with live music. <laughs> So I had very little sleep. Um, now, as a transport spokesperson, I'm probably one of the few people who, to enjoy the challenges of travelling up here from, from London yesterday. Now, to be fair, the journey up was simple, if not cheap, uh, but it'll be another story going home today because I live in Cardiff, so it'll take me five hours. And it's no consolation to know that if I had been prepared to split my <coughs> tickets and spend hours on a website, I could have got it for rather cheaper. So what sort of crazy system is that? Now, what have I just done? I've done what most of us do, which is to talk about my last journey, my last travel, how I got here all the problems I had underway. It's just like being a GP, you know. People talk to me all the time about their transport problems. But we all discuss it, rather like the weather. It's a conversation opener. Um, so let me ask you, how many of you came here today by train? And me. Uh, how many of you came by bus? How many of you came by car? I rather feared that. Did anyone live locally enough to walk or come by bike? Hooray! <laughs> okay, so I've got the picture. Now, everyone travels, except of course for that tiny minority of people who are effectively housebound, often by disability, and they wish they could travel. But of course, there isn't the disability friendly <coughs> transport available. But our party, I believe, often misses a trick because we don't emphasize transport enough in our policies and we don't emphasize enough solutions, Liberal Democrat solutions, to that. <coughs> and we live on a crowded island with chronic underinvestment in infrastructure over many decades with a lack of government investment in day-to-day -day solutions, which would help us to use public transport, and crucially, a lack of government commitment to cleaning up the air we breathe and to improving uh, the, the quality of emissions and so on to save our planet. Now, we've got a precarious, failed government consumed by Brexit with neither the time, the commitment, nor the parliamentary majority to take the lead in the bold, imaginative steps that we need to take as a nation to deal with the mess in our transport system. Now, in government, in coalition, we started to take those steps. And don't doubt me when I tell you that it was hard. To say the Tories' hearts weren't really in it is a huge understatement. Norman Baker, Susan Kramer as Transport Ministers, Ed Davey in Energy, and Vince Cable, of course, in Biz, introduced a host of imaginative and environmentally friendly policies. Electrification of the railways and the opening up of new lines or reopening lines. Fun, funds for ultra-low emission buses, grants for electric cars and for charging points, all those now abandoned or severely watered down. Now, as transport spokesperson, what I've tried to do is to put the passenger and the environment at the heart of our policies. People who talk about transport, who are actually overwhelmingly men who, who work in the industry, always talk about it, in my experience, 
from the technical standpoint. They will discuss the class of trains. They will not discuss how comfortable the seats were and how clean it was. All right, so we've got to change the terminology, change the way we talk about it. Now, sometimes it's been quite difficult to get our message across, partly because we're a very small party in Parliament, but also because the bad news on transport is coming so thick and fast that actually it's difficult to get a word in. So I'm here because the North West has suffered worse than most from the debacle that has gone on under Chris Grayling at the Department for Transport. And I'm here today to encourage you to put transport at the centre of your campaigning for the next elections and as a general rule. I am here to tell you to demand better. And it doesn't matter whether you live in Liverpool or rural Cumbria, there is a transport problem for you to solve. So I'm going to talk about some of the issues that we've taken up in Parliament, all of which will cascade down into local campaigns, from train timetables to saving your local bus route. You can make a big difference to local lives you can even make a big difference to a, the life of a whole town if your campaign is successful enough. And it's best to start with an example of shining success. Tim Farron's campaign to save the Lakes train service. It was cut totally in June by Northern Rail at the time of the timetable fiasco. He, Tim, stepped in with imaginative local campaigning, thinking outside the box, with the can-do approach that we identify, I think, with him. And the story goes, and I'm sure he'll put you right this afternoon if I've got it wrong, the story goes that he simply rang up his local heritage railway and said, there will be no Northern Line trains on our, our lines from now onwards, can you put on a replacement service? And the answer they gave him was, well, not today. <laughs> but they did it by next week, which is what they promised. It hit the headlines. And I'm told that the instruction now within Northern Rail is that whatever happens, whatever goes wrong, you don't cut the Lakes Line service. And this week, Tim followed it up with a bill in Parliament to require the Secretary of State to terminate failing franchises and to allow the creation of local franchising authorities, giving power back to the people. Now, of course, there are many other areas that suffered in that timetable fiasco. Uh, for example, Furness and also that, that line and the Morecambe branch also suffered uh, right in the middle of the summer when visitors wanted to go and visit. That had a huge impact on local trade. Now the key point is that the franchising system is a mess across the country. And there's a rail review. Now don't hold your breath on this. It won't report for a year. And it is the fourth rail review we've had since 2011. And I tend to think DFT could save some money and some time and reread the previous three, which all agreed with each other. <coughs> now, Labour has a seductively attractive policy. Bring back nationalisation. Renationalise the lot. I tend to think that people who call for that weren't there the first time around. <laughs> BR did not have a good name. British Rail presided over 30 years of stagnation and lack of investment. And with the record that Department for Transport has in running the railways, would you actually want to put them in control of the whole lot? They're already in, in, in control of half of the reports, that's called network rail. 
And, ne and Labour's voodoo economics ignores the fact that the moment you announce that you're going to end the franchise system, take the franchises off the companies involved, they're going to stop investing, aren't they? They're going to run the service with the minimum of effort. And so you are going to have years of dislocation and disinvestment. It also ignores the fact that there are twice as many passengers today as there were at the time of privatisation of the railways. And there has been, and is continuing to be, a huge investment in new rolling stock. What I think is a, a better approach is the Liberal Democrat approach. We want a more flexible franchise system tailored to local circumstances. We want to allow local authorities to invest in services, either alone or in partnership. We want to set up cooperative and mutual models, giving passengers and, crucially, railway staff a say in running the franchise. Anyone who's been subject to uh, strikes will know that the staff are not exactly the, um, uh, fully in support of the changes that are taking place in the industry. One has to talk these things through. And we want to develop franchises more along the model of the successful management agreements that they have in London, run by Transport for London. After all, you've got Transport for the North here, ready and waiting to take over. But railways are about a lot more than the franchises. What about the cost of a ticket? It's an insult to passengers to expect them to pay more each year for a declining service. This is what really worries people. How much they pay for it, whether the service is efficient, not who is running it. Regulated fares are due to go up in January by 3.6%. And you can be sure it's the one thing on the railways that will happen on time. <laughs> That's in line with RPI. <coughs> we want, I have called for, a fares freeze for a whole year so that you should not have any increase in fares for the year. At the end of that, any agreement, any increases should be in line with CPI, which is a lower level of inflation. It can be afforded. After all, governments have um, frozen the fuel duty escalator for nine successive years. If they can afford to help motorists, they can afford to help rail passengers. And along with cheaper fares, there must be easier access to compensation when things go wrong. Now, I can't talk about railways in the northwest of England without talking about HS2. The first thing I want to say is it can't be allowed to soak up all rail investment. At least as important as, as HS2 are the east-west links. The Trans-Pennine route, for instance. Now, investment here is crucial, and it must go ahead. But Network Rail have already warned that it will lead to five years of disruption. I understand what that means. I live in Cardiff, where electrification has, had, has led to five years of disruption, and it isn't ready yet. So it is painful, but it has to be done. At least in, as important as that as well, are just the general regular existing links that need to be made as efficient as possible, often swifter, often more frequent. The HS2 system situation is not yet settled. Don't think it's a done deal. In Manchester, there's a sensible campaign for a new Manchester Piccadilly underground station so that if you have an HS3 in the future, you can carry on from Liverpool to Hull uh, without having to build a new station, 
why, why build, uh, want something now and then have to amend it in 10 years time? And in Liverpool, there's a vigorous campaign for 20 miles more, uh, so that HS2 extends to Liverpool. But HS2 is controversial in London. It is soaking up a lot of money of a government that hasn't got much. And flaky Tory support, could I fear, lead to it being, in the end, just a quick way to get from Birmingham to London. So it's vital that you keep up the pressure, you keep up your demands, uh, hopefully coordinated, well coordinated across the region. And that's where Transport for the North comes in. It's a vital concept, but just bear in mind its political godfather in Westminster, George Osborne, is long gone. He's gone off to half a dozen other jobs, one of which is editing the Evening Standard. And I love reading the Evening Standard, because on a daily basis, he criticises and harries to read so many, um, <laughs> under the guise of the editorial comment. Transport for the North is still a fledgling institution. It doesn't have the powers or the money it needs. It's constantly demanding, balancing the demands of various local authorities. And I've talked to them several times recently. And despite having some very good ideas, for example, on smart ticketing, it's clear that they're going to be in the planning stage for some time. So you need to be emphasising the importance of the government granting them the powers to control rail franchises and giving them full control of the funding they need to join up the north of England. Because without that, progress will be patchy and trains from Liverpool to Manchester will continue to be slower now than they were in Victorian times. Now, railways get most of the limelight for good reasons and bad, but many of you are sitting here thinking, well, this is all very well, but there's no train service anywhere near where I live. It's been like that since Beeching, hasn't it? Most people travel by bus. The poorest, the oldest and the youngest rely on buses most of all. So the recent steep decline in bus services has hit a lot of people very hard. The bus network, and forgive me, I'm going to give you some figures and statistics now. The bus network has shrunk by 8% in a decade. And if that doesn't sound like much, let me put it another way. It shrunk by 134 million miles. And Northwest England is one of the areas worst hit. It is actually the area worst hit by this shrinkage. It's lost a quarter of its miles from its network. Worst hit areas include Warrington, North Yorkshire, Stoke, I know that you probably think Stoke's a bit south, but it's, uh, uh, it's a sign of how bad things are in the area. On average, one third of bus subsidies have been withdrawn in the last four years. That's withdrawn by local councils. <coughs> it's a 21st century equivalent of the beaching cuts of the 1960s. Now, why has it happened? Because unlike beaching, there is no dark mastermind behind these, budget cut, these bus cuts. It simply happened because the government has cut and cut again local authority funding. So councils now at the are now at the point where they are forced to concentrate almost exclusively on their legal obligations and beyond a small core of subsidised bus routes, they don't have a legal obligation to provide a bus service. Some councils, of course, have done much better than others. Some have had imaginative solutions involving community transport schemes, but many councils have just felt not able to prioritise bus services. And in rural areas where bus services were already very sparse, they've often gone altogether. The government, 
to me, seems prepared to completely abandon certain groups of people. And let's be honest, they'll have done their analysis. Most Tory supporters can usually afford to, to up, take a taxi or own a car. The Tories are very ruthless at looking after their own and prioritising the things that their own want. So if you are poorer and less likely to be a Tory supporter, you will have been dismissed from their list of priorities. Now, rural areas suffer most because rural air services are usually not profitable. Quite simply, they don't have enough passengers per mile. There's sometimes a different picture in urban areas. In Manchester, for instance, they tell me they have too many buses competing with each other, making roads even more congested. Since the deregulation of the buses in the 1980s, and I was on the transport committee in Cardiff when that took place, um, in areas outside London, there has been an increasing contrast between plentiful public transport in London and the rest of us. The government had the opportunity to put this right last year when we passed the Bus Services Act. Now there was vigorous pressure from me and a team of people who came in uh, to take part from the Liberal Democrat benches, but we failed to persuade the government to make the changes needed to provide good bus services everywhere. Sal Brinton gained important concessions on wheelchair access and we did get somewhere on improved signage and information on buses. But Ross Scott led an amendment on the ability of older people to use a concessionary bus passes or minibuses. You can't do it. Um, but uh, the government wouldn't accept that. We had a very lively debate on the Liberal Democrat policy to provide concessionary fares for young people. Now, some bus companies and councils do, but many don't. For young people, think about this, for young people, buses are the access to education, to a job, to an apprenticeship, and to a social life. So if you invest in their ability to get on the bus and use the bus, then you are helping your local economy, you're helping the future economy, and you're helping the social fabric of the area. They're less likely to move away, and of course, they're less likely to become lifelong habitual car drivers. And in the long term, we've got to encourage people out of their cars. We wanted the government in that uh, bill to allow bus franchising by local councils so that they could run their local buses yet again. <coughs> and that was rejected out of hand um, for the councils in general, but it was allowed for areas with a directly elected mayor. So if you live in a rural area, it's no use to you, but it is something that can and probably will happen in areas with directly elected mayors. And we wanted councils once again to be able to set up their own bus services. After all, if you look across the country, some of the best bus services across the country are the handful of bus services run by local authorities still. Um, the government refused to allow that despite the fact that I said, well, what about an, a council in a rural area where the last bus has just gone because the commercial people aren't interested? I can imagine, you know, that the council might want to buy a few buses and run their own small local bus service. But that apparently was not uh, acceptable. Any power given to local authorities was very suspect. So the Bus Services Act was a real missed opportunity. As you've all admitted by putting up your hands, most of you came by car. A very wise decision, I think, on a very wet and windy day. And we are all going to continue to do that for many years. But in the last few years, we've come to understand the damage of our environment to our environment from petrol and diesel cars. 
and in particular, damage to our health and our children's health. There are a dozen different illnesses <coughs> that are made worse or caused by diesel emissions and the fumes um, that go with them. If you're in any, uh, if you have any interest in this, there was a very good report a couple of weeks ago from UNICEF that highlighted that <coughs> children suffer most, not least because they're physically developing, but because when we walk them along the street, hand in hand, they're nearer the exhaust fumes and the tailpipes of the cars than we are. And when they sit in the back of the car or on the route to school, that's where all the fumes congregate. Now, we are all unaware of this. We're surprised because you can't smell it usually, um, and you certainly can't see it. So we need to switch to alternative fuels, electricity, of course, possibly hydrogen. And the government introduced an automated and electric vehicles bill. I, will, I don't actually think automated vehicles <coughs> is, is a, a likely source of Lib Dem campaigning in the near future, so we'll leave that one aside. Um, but they introduced a bill which was an awful bill, but we managed to knock it into some sort of shape. And I began to have a little bit of hope because after years of failing to meet EU air quality standards and being taken to court and so on, the government produced a road to zero strategy uh, to increase the use of electric vehicles, to discourage the most polluting ones. <coughs> now, it wasn't very ambitious, but it was there. Um, and then I heard that next week we have Clean Growth Week. Excellent, I thought. They're beginning <coughs> to look at this in detail. And then the day before yesterday, they announced that they were cutting the grants to encourage people to buy electric and hybrid vehicles. You almost couldn't make it up for the stupidity of it. So they have a bill to encourage us to use them and they've just cut the market from under the feet of uh, the, the automotive industry. Slowing it down, slowing the development uh, considerably. Now, as Liberal Democrats, we've got a 15-point plan, cleaning up the air we breathe. It's radical, it's ambitious, but it's achievable because the ambitions we've put in there are no more than other countries are achieving. And there are lots of points in that 15-point that are for the central government, but there are also lots of things that you can campaign on <coughs> with your local council in your local area. And a little bit of advertising, I've put some copies of it on the, uh, on the table uh, as you go out in the, in the entrance hall. You can also get them uh, from ALDC, who are advertising them uh, through their website. Now, I'll give you some examples of what we're suggesting. The testing of air quality and warning signs around schools. Um, so that you put up a testing station near a school, you put up a warning sign when that air quality is bad. Uh, you, you have a campaign to ban vehicle idling outside schools, hospitals, outside the entrance to parks, for instance, uh, to encourage people that if, they, uh, if they're feeling too hot in their car in July, they might get out of it rather than just running the air conditioning. Um, in Oxford, they're converting lampposts into charging stations. Suggests that your council might look at increasing the number of charging stations. Have some in the local supermarket car park. Get your supermarket to put one in its car park. Campaigning for safer walking to school routes. Cam asking your local school to have a walking bus, if it doesn't already, to encourage children to walk. Encouraging people to cycle to school if there is a safe route. 
campaigning for more ultra-low emission buses in your local town. All those things are do easily done through local campaigning. Um, there's an awful lot of congestion associated with the school run. If we get back to walking and cycling wherever possible, we can make a huge change to our health, not just by meaning that we probably, through doing more exercise, might weigh a bit less, but also because we will have fewer fumes that we are breathing in. Now, I want very briefly, because it's relevant to some of you, to talk about um, air travel. We oppose Heathrow expansion. I've never thought that the answer to the north of England's problems was a new runway in the south of England. But you don't want to start your holiday by travelling to the south. But there are good and useful airports in the north of England that need to be used most effectively. But we need to look at the environmental impact. Manchester, for example, you can travel from there across uh, to more destinations than you can from Heathrow. But what you as Liberal Democrats could campaign on is making sure that the surface links to the airport are improved. That's a big campaign. Or campaigning with the airports themselves to make sure that all their service vehicles on the airport itself are electric or ultra low emission. That's perfectly attainable. Now, I've gone on for a long time and I haven't actually talked about Brexit. <laughs> and I'm afraid this isn't quite a Brexit free speech because the impact of Brexit in particular on an, 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 and the impact of a no deal Brexit on the transport industry is huge. It will choke our ports it will put local hauliers out of business. It will undermine our car industry and our <coughs> aerospace industry. And there's a hidden problem across northwest England. There are hundreds and thousands of SMEs who are part of a complex sub international supply chain for these industries. If their components, the ones they produce, they manufacture, <coughs> are not improve, approved in terms of standards, or able to flow freely and unchecked through ports and airports as part of just-in-time delivery systems, then they will lose their customers, and the people of the northwest of England will lose their jobs. So this is, folks, in the short term, and for the long-term prosperity of our country, the biggest campaign of all. It's a national emergency with only five months to go. And you can influence the outcome of this, as you well know. I suggest you might identify any local companies who are involved in those industries. Talk to local people. Explain why we need a people's vote and get them to add their voice to the clamour that we are creating for a people's vote. We've got to, every single voice makes it louder until it becomes a deafening roar. And of course the other thing you can do is to take to the streets next Saturday and make that march, which will already be very big, much bigger than ever. <coughs> So whatever you do, wherever you live, there's a transport campaign that needs you, that needs a Liberal Democrat voice and a Liberal Democrat solution. So please get out there and demand better. <laughs>